when I write ya. All across the USC, Compton, Watts, Bay to LA. From on the California, from valley to valley, we represent that killer Cali. So if you keeping it real on your side of your town, you tune in to Gangsta Chronicles. Gangsta Chronicles, we gon' tell you how we go. Pinocchio, we gon' tell you the truth and nothing but the truth. Oh. Gangsta Chronicles, this is not your average show. You're now tuned into the real MCA, Big James, and Big Stair. This is strictly from the streets. Hello. We represent the James. Welcome to another episode of the Gangsta Chronicles podcast. I'm with my homeboys. Big James. 8-8, eight, eight, what's cracking? What's happening, man? Make sure you go bang on that iHeart button, man. Go to Apple Podcasts, subscribe, rate, leave a comment. You know, California is the land of sunshine, beaches, and palm trees, but it has a dangerous underbelly. In 2019, the state of California led the country of murders with 1,690. In L.A., we've seen the 1996 murder of Tupac Shakur, followed by the murder of New York's notorious B.I.G. in 1997. As a recent Los Angeles rapper, Nipsey Hussle as well, he was brutally gunned down in front of his Marathon clothing store, and we saw a rise in New York rapper Pop Smoke murdered in a home invasion. He was only 20 years old. Joining us tonight, we have former LAPD detective and author of Murder Rap, the untold story of the Biggie Smalls and Tupac Shakur murder investigation, Mr. Greg Cady. Hey, guys. How you doing, man? Subscribe again. All right, all right. Man, you know, it's a lot of... Um, California, man, is one of those deceptive places, man. It's beautiful out here, the palm trees, the beaches, the weather. But we leave the country in murders, man. I, I didn't know that until you just said it. Yeah, I, I did that research. Beautiful. I did research that, man. We are leading the country in murders. It's a lot of people that get back whacked every year out here. We back yep. on top. Yep, as a well, state. And then it seemed like it's because of the pandemic, it seemed like it got worse. Yeah. You know, when we was on lockdown, you had people out at 3 o'clock in the morning doing drive-bys. What the hell? Yeah, that's some crazy shit right there. And for us to be back on, for us to be back on top, shit, you know, because the way shit is right now, and you, all you hear is the youngsters in Sh- in Chi Town getting exactly. busy. Right, you know that's what, what I would have guessed. Uh, uh, it, it, to hear that we back on top with the murders is crazy as, as fuck. Yeah, well, you got to remember that's the state of California as a whole. You in, you encompass Oakland, San Francisco, L.A., San Bernardino. That's everywhere. So you know, it's a big state. It's a, it's a dangerous place, man. Uh, and we could take it back, man, um, to when you went to had the notorious B.I.G. investigation, correct? Yeah. And until, uh, but much after the murder, you know, I didn't get involved in that until 2006. What did you see with that, man? What do you think the whole thing was with that? You think it was, I know we obviously never caught who did it, and I don't even know if we did, know who did it, if it's even worth talking about now. Um, what are your thoughts on that, man? Well, I, I think that what happened is a combination of things. First of all, back in '97, when it was when it was initially being investigated, I don't think that the, the guys that were involved at LAPD um, fully understood the culture within the music, and they understood the gang, you know, component of it all. But they just had so much trouble breaking through that barrier of that, you know, you don't don't talk, don't snitch type of thing. And that was the case so often in, in Los Angeles and as James knows in Compton, those gang homicides are really tough to solve. And you know, 60 to 75 percent of those homicides don't get solved just because of that, no, you know, don't tell culture. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was one of the barriers that they, that they faced in trying to figure out what happened to, to Big. And you know, not to be the dead horse, man, do you think that was in retaliation, man, for the murder of Biggie? One, no, for Pac. For Pac, for Mark Pac. 100%, I mean. absolutely, positively. Mm. 100%. I can honestly say, I was there, and the tension, the 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 way people felt when Tupac died, the way I felt, I think, you know, at that time, being active, and then somebody get killed on your watch mm-hmm. is a must. You ain't got a choice but to retaliate. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and when Pac was killed, it was so crazy. How, how niggas gonna get to New York and get these fools? Mm-hmm. Or oh, we just gotta wait till they come back. They can't come back to California. But bam, Biggie is is in California doing. I'm going back to Cali. He he should have never came out here. He had no business out here at all. No. So 
it was a it was an opportunity for payback and and both of those dudes lost their lives just on some BS because everybody know Suge was on some bullshit and Puffy was on some bullshit and they were still communicating with each other, but so called in the cut. Mm -hmm. And some of the homies knew that, but didn't nobody want to do nothing about that. And I think it was best and it benefited both of them because you had a South Side and a Mob thing. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? And they both benefited off of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when them guys came to Compton, they went straight to to the South Sides. Mm -hmm. They went over there with with Lil Keith and them, and Big Keith, and all of those other guys. And they were like bodyguards for them. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it was just a crazy, it was a crazy thing because like I told him when when they jumped Orlando, mm-hmm. this little cat is a hitter. You know what I'm saying? And and Tupac should have never got in got in. Eight is a is a rapper. He should never have to get out there when he paying people mm-hmm. to to watch his body. Mm-hmm. If anybody get close to eight, snatch him. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That didn't happen here. They treated Pac like he was one of the homies getting high, drinking, and these are the consequences of it. So uh, both sides didn't do what they were supposed to do. They got Both sides got caught soon. Is it that, you know, Jane, us being from, you know, gangs and shit like that and affiliated, when Pac showed up, did, did, did y'all feel like because of Suge you know, getting him out and all that when he started claiming a mob or whatever, that y'all feel like he was like just that's the authentic home. No, I was I was one because the hood was the hood to me. Exactly. I I I man I did the like hood. How did you feel about I was I'm, you you I'm, know I'm how they you, you know somebody I was a show. gang member. Exactly. And to have somebody come in here I don't care where you're from. You didn't you didn't run this turf. You went around here. You didn't get down like that. You went on the block. So Tupac, I didn't accept that. And and he shouldn't have never been from the hood. He's an artist. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. He's 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 here to make money. And once once you, once you lose the head, then the money's over. And once Tupac died, every now everybody is bam 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 bam. Everybody gone. Because mm-hmm. Suge ain't got it no more. Now Suge is doing. You know, the drugs and the drinking and all this. I never seen that dude drink or do nothing. But now he done turned into it. You know what I'm saying? So when Tupac put the neighborhood on him, I was furious. I, man, I was furiated because, sure, I don't care who you think you are. I brought you here. How you going to tell this dude he can put the hood on him? You ain't got it on you. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So the whole thing was out of line. And then, you know, just to have that man come in from where he was and then then start gang banging, it don't work like that. So I, I never accepted it. I didn't hang with him. I didn't kick it with him. Because if I did that, I accept him as one of the homies. And I couldn't do that. Yeah. And, and the rabbit hole certainly gets deep in that case, man, because you have uh, accusations of... Uh, Puffy being paid a certain amount of money to execute, Puffy paying a certain amount of money to execute this thing, this revenge thing, because, you know, Pac was making the songs and he was really going at them. So it got real personal at a point. And when some of those songs came out, I said that I said, man, somebody might die because this don't sound like no normal rap feud type of stuff. You know what I mean? Exactly. It, well, it was serious. It got, it got serious, I think, in my opinion, after Jake got killed out in Atlanta. Right. You mm-hmm. know, when they had beef out there and... That's when there's, there's no turning back. Right, exactly. So I think that might have been the first time where blood was actually spilled um, over this over this uh, beef when uh, Puffy's guy Wolf shot Jake, and then you know you, you can't turn it back after that. As a matter of fact, there's a witness there. It was kind of interesting. A witness that uh, that that scene had heard Suge say had heard Suge say to uh, Puff. You took something precious from me. I'm going to take something precious from you. And, you know, that could mean a lot of different things. But mm-hmm. now that we see Big get killed, maybe it plays into that whole, I'm, we're going to get even for what you just did to Jay. Yeah, and man. then, of course, Tupac happens and makes it all down. Well, Tupac shouldn't have happened. Right. That shouldn't have happened. You got 
15, 17, 18 bloods right there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And if, if your job is to protect him and Suge, then that's what you're supposed to do. Exactly. Tupac, and I say this all the time, people get mad. Tupac didn't even know who Orlando was. Never been in Compton a day in his life. Never hung with the South Side. It ain't like the hood had pictures of motherfuckers who they wanted. Mm -hmm. So why the fuck he walking up to a, good, a dude he don't know? One of the homies is, that's him right there. No, you a gangster, you go get him. Mm -hmm. And that's what Pac should have said, but him trying to prove himself and mm -hmm. talking about it, he with it, he went over there and, 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 and handled his business. And yeah. those guys knew that that little dude was with the business. Yeah. He was a, he was a hitter. Yeah, baby, that ain't wasn't no joke. Oh no, he was a hitter. Yeah, and I, and I truly think if it would have been any one of those guys that have went and socked him, it would have waited until it went back to Compton. I don't think it would have been that thing. See, I think, is, yeah, now it's a game back. Yeah, time. because I think like this, you know, Orlando, he a hitter, and he thinking his head. Man, by the time this shit get back to L.A., they gonna have the pop whoop my ass that he don't did this and that. So he was like, this motherfucker gotta go. In his mind, you know. He, he basically any any anybody that's with it that's on the streets and doing their thing, you got to look at your reputation, what people' perception is of a certain situation. Mm -hmm. Orlando was, man, a nigga, a rapper took off on me. Now, the mob in Southside had squabbles on Long Beach numerous times. Exactly. Alanda would have understood that squabble. Did it take 15 cats to jump him like that? Normally the hood didn't get down like that. But when Tupac would call him, everybody high and everybody drunk, boom, they mobbed him. Now, y'all didn't leave me laying there. So let me gather my folks and this whole Bloods and Crips, whoever, if you got that mentality, Damn right. I'm finna come get you. <laughs> I'm gonna catch you. Vegas ain't that big. And everybody was in the same spots. Mm -hmm. And shit, Compton ain't that big. Yeah. So, so before you get back to the to the, to the it's coming. man, come on. It's man. coming. Oh, so And everybody knew where they were going. Exactly. That night. It was like, well, you we have to be ready. go down the street if you're looking for these guys. They came to 662 at first. Before when Children was already at the fights, they came and pulled up at 662. But they knew if they'd have tried something at 662, they'd have been in trouble. We was already ready for whatever. Mm -hmm. A week prior to that, they was talking about they was coming. My daughter and mother was was on it. You watch yourself, they talking about they coming and shoot up six. No, it was so many Metro up there, pathetic. So they weren't gonna try nothing there. <clears throat> so when they went to the fight, that's when it all happened. After the fight was over and, and Orlando, they caught him by himself, standing there by himself. It's over. Tupac shouldn't have never did what he did. So it, it seems like the premise deals was the California period as a whole. And I'm going to ask you, Greg, as a police officer, it seems like everything out here is built on revenge. Like they did this to me and I'm not going to let it go. They have to go. I, I wouldn't look at it as revenge, man. Not really revenge. It's from as long as I was gang banging. We never looked at it as revenge. It was just the code of of, of retaliation of, of what you do. They hit us, you hit them. Well, that's revenge, ain't it? Yeah, we, it didn't look at, <laughs> we didn't look at it like that. You look at it like, man, you, there's no it, it was like choices. It, it, we looked at it like, it was like this is the code. Like, yeah. oh, man, we, the, it, it was never like the suggestion, oh, man, we finna get revenge on these motherfuckers. No, mm -hmm. it's what you fucking do. Somebody come through blasting or jump the homie or do whatever. Mm -hmm. the, the, if you didn't, was more of fucking you niggas is busters. Exactly. Y'all didn't go back and them niggas jumped the homie. It, it didn't even have to be a fucking drive. And, and that played a big part with the South Sides because if they didn't go and do what they had to do, mm -hmm. then they'd have been looked at like that. Puffy would have been like, Man, they whoop whoop your nephew and y'all motherfuckers didn't do nothing. Man, exactly. Y'all get away from us. Y'all winnies. Well, look, people on, on the up. outside look at it in the perspective of, well, that's some revenge shit. You know, they killed his friend. Now they're going back to kill him. We looked at it as a shit. That's what you do when you start banging mm -hmm. and claiming the hood. 
and they both took. Yeah, maybe yeah. maybe the maybe revenge seems a little bit more of where it's an emotional response. Exactly. Where what you're talking about, I'm assuming, is more of like this is the business of it. This is just it. Yeah. Back in the day, Al Capone and them, one of they people get killed, the, the liquor get taken. They didn't look at shit like, oh yeah, we're gonna get revenge on them. They came fuck. in the car with no, the Tommy gun. This is what you do. Oh, they hit him? Now it's time to your turn to go hit them. And then if you don't. Yeah. If you don't, then you you might well fuck it. You you supposed to be the boss and (laughs) you didn't go take revenge. Oh man, fuck it. Kill that motherfucker. (laughs) Next person step up. Yeah, exactly. And in that culture, (laughs) reputation is everything. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't take revenge, you got these other people looking like, man, I don't been back. They're gonna come try to take your place. Yeah, they're gonna come try to take your place. They're gonna replace you. Mm -hmm. you, you They're gonna replace you. They if go you got your ass kicked and you, you ain't calling the right players. shots. So we got this whole thing, and it seemed like to me the one that was just the most innocent of them all that kind of got caught in the crossfire was Biggie. Yeah, I feel the same way. You know, like I, I really like when Biggie died because I met him a couple of times before, and this before he got big. I saw him up at Prince's Club, Glam Slam. I did a couple of shows with Big. And he was a cool dude. It's like, I remember him because he didn't seem like no celebrity type of dude. He was just real kickback. Let me ask you this. Hmm? With with all of the shit that was going on, do you honestly say Biggie was sitting there saying, y'all keep me out of this? No, but I, I ain't think, got nothing to do no, with No, but this. listen, I think his he boss... He was riding with the bad boy. Well, you got to remember this. Yeah, he was riding with bad boy, but at that time... Biggie wasn't calling those shots like that to connect this dot and get this and hang. I think he was just playing his role. He was with Bad Boy, so he was just kind of one of them things. He was just, he was there. I mean, from from the perspective of hip hop and music, it didn't look like his influence was was much on the fuck that shit. Mm -hmm. But. Behind closed doors, you, yeah, you never say, know what somebody's yeah, saying. Fucker probably sitting there like, man, fuck them niggas too. Mm-hmm. Because fuck I know for too. I know for a fact, man, um, <clears throat> Pac was running up and he had ran up in faith. I know that for a fact because you know I used to run with Psych. Okay. And he told me that she was at the hotel and I guess Pac was staying at some kind of hotel and she was up there frequently. And you know he came in the room one day, Pac, you know, and he said she was in the bed, hair frazzled up, like she's got fans. So you thinking? His wife getting knocked down by his enemy, you know, so you never know what was said behind closed doors. You just never know. Well, I, I, I would have been mad, but uh, I don't know. I ain't going to talk about Faith. I don't know her. And what she did with Pac, because her and Pac was cool. And and it probably was one of them nights where she was towed up and shit happened. But he accepted her back, and they was doing their thing. A females get emotional over shit. You get what I'm saying? Who know, who know what the situation is? But I don't look at that as a fucking fuck it. Bitch cheat on you, you cheat on you. You know, I don't think that's gonna lead to you know a, a, a dude in that position. Well, it's a combination of things. You got a dude talking bad about you. He knock your woman down, and he just pretty much smashing them. You humiliate him. They don't make me want to kill a motherfucker. That's too weak of a yeah, cause right there. That's for kind me of to a... want to kill a nigga. Yeah. I'm gonna kill a nigga because a motherfucker did some evil shit, right. and they coming after us. That's just like I mean, I know it's a simplicity of back in the days, niggas. Some niggas would get killed over bitches in the neighborhood. There's a lot of brothers in prison behind, behind exactly. Females. That's what I'm saying. Me. But that's being saying in a position more. of Fucking a hip hop dude and mm-hmm. you know publicity and whatever. I don't think, bitch, you fucked a motherfucker. I'm gonna go fuck a motherfucker too. It's not gonna be to the point of because that's their mentality. I don't know what their mentality is from New York. I know what L.A. niggas would do or Compton right. niggas do. Now, we just got that fucking mentality. I don't give a fuck. Well, the, and 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 this is the bottom line too. Big in Tupac. Everybody know what's happening. Everybody know who killed who. And yet, nobody went to jail behind it because it. I think politics plays a big part, even with your investigation and what you did, and then putting it out there. I went to Australia with him, and listening to no, the last one we did when I, when I came when you had the debate, how people want to twist a story, how people want to take credit for something, how people. Uh, uh, want to be mad over certain issues and, and 
they just jumped the board on the situation or or this and that happened. If you got the actual facts of what really is going on and documents showing what happened, like you had, people still don't care. They still don't want to hear it. And people still want to talk about Biggie and Tupac when, man, those dudes are gone. They're gone, and, and people should let them dudes rest. D put a book out and said, told, basically told the story. Did you believe that he was being like like 100% truthful? Yeah, well, I know he was being 100% truthful when I interviewed him mm-hmm. because there was, no, there was no motivation to lie. Once he started to kind of tell the story in a little bit different, I mean, it's the same narrative for all intent and purposes, but he did change a couple little things. I think when he put his book out, he said, yeah, Pac was going for a gun. Right. Well, of course, he never mentions that with us because we know that didn't happen. But he wants to build in a self-defense right. so that yeah. if he gets wrapped up on something, mm-hmm. he can say, hey, man, this dude had a, you know, in his mind, he's trying to either justify it or build in a defense going, well, the dude was going for a gun and Orlando shot in self-defense, blah, blah, blah. It's a bunch of bullshit, but it's still the same story. Orlando, Keefe, and the other two boys were in the car and they shot and killed Pac. Right. Um, so, yeah, I feel like he was telling the truth for all, you know, for the most part. Yeah, you know, you, you have that situation, man, that just, you know, put a black eye on things, man. Um, when you were working at Homicide, man, what was the main premise behind the majority of the murders, man? Was it revenge? Was it um, retaliation, jealousy, crimes of passion? Which one would you say was the biggest influence? Well, within within the gang investigations, it was always back to just street business. It was just like these guys are saying, you know, it's just back and forth and back and just forth. Just occupational hazard. Just occupational hazard. But there were a lot of those that did happen over, over some girls. You know, there's some squabbles over a girl. She gets in the middle of something. Next thing you know, these guys are shooting and killing each other. Um, a lot of it was dope related, you know, mm-hmm. just holding their territories and stuff like that. And then, of course, a lot of homicides were domestic, mm-hmm. you know, so it all depends on what kind of, you know, atmosphere we're talking about with these murders. And a lot of prostitutes get killed, occupational hazard. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it just really kind of depends on, on what we're talking about. So being a, uh, a you know, joining the cops, whatever, um, do you feel being an officer, that some cases were investigated differently than a lot of minority homicides or L.A. Compton or whatever? Were there different approaches or effort put into different cases? So, yes and no. Like, the the intent to solve it is always there, you know? That's what a homicide investigator, he wants to solve his cases. You know, he wants to build his resume. I want to be known as a guy that can solve cases. I care about them because I want to solve them, either because it's, you know, it it reflects on how good I am as an investigator. Um, Most of us are empathetic towards the victims. Even if they're gangsters, we care about the families and the moms and the sisters and the wives and all of that. So we do. However, to the the flip side of that point is the resources that Mm -hmm. go into a high profile murder or some kid from USC Mm -hmm. who's playing football versus a guy down in South Central LA who got shot at the liquor store. It's the resources that make oftentimes all the difference. Mm. You know, because these investigations get get really expensive. So whoever killed Big Tony, the pimp, his shit gonna go in the cold cases because we ain't even trying to solve that shit. They got rid of a a badass for us. So, I mean, it's like they pick and choose what... what we really need to go after, who we really, if, if this guy killed a five-year-old girl and raped a five-year-old girl, we got to get him off the street, mm-hmm. right? right? Opposed to us killing each other and just laying each other on the ground. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's basically, these is going to keep happening, but this cat crossed the line raping and killing a five-year-old child. Them are the pedophiles we got to get off there. Regardless how many of these cases we solve, they're going to keep coming. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you've, you, there's victims and then there's truly innocent right. victims. Oh, the victim you know, part. If, if you're a gangster and you're in that game and you're putting yourself into a situation where you know, you're likely to get killed, you're contributing to that. Right. You know? So it's not like a kid who's you know, walking home from school and gets hit by a stray bullet. Mm-hmm. And I never understood that part 
um, pain is pain. I didn't understand that until my brother Alton died. Uh, the the face I saw on my mom's, the the way my sister and them cried. I mean, my 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 mom pain was like she was just straight wounded. You know what I'm saying? And it was like, damn, why the fuck? What there was there nothing I could say? And I just had to sit there and think, like, damn, is this what I do to people? This is the reaction mm -hmm. the families get. So you got to look at it as the mamas, the aunties, the, the, the babies, the girlfriends. You affect maybe a thousand lives just by one, hurting one person. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then we do this over the course of our lives. And then when it hit home, you're like, damn. It's, it's definitely not a victimless crime because I couldn't um, imagine losing a child. And you know, you, you got to think about this. No matter what that person is doing, whether he a pimp, gangster, or, or whoever, there's somebody out there that love that dude. There's somebody out there that love that woman. You know, so it, it's definitely, and that's why I think I wanted to talk about it so much. We have been talking about it over the past yeah. few days, just talking about it. it's a lot of unnecessary violence out here. And I think, and I even feel ashamed saying this, I think it's black on black crime is just worse than anything else. I think black people do each other worse than any other, like, I think we the biggest threat to each other. We are. You know, bigger than any police we officer, are. bigger than anybody else. It's of just course. like. I mean, because when you grow up in these poverty stricken neighborhoods and ghettos and, you know, mama on the county getting county checks and motherfuckers don't be seeing this no hope. And then so the first thing you do is go join the gang and you start serving and doing all that shit. And that's your fucking mentality. It's like. Okay, that's my brother. That's my brother, but I wasn't taught that shit. But well, being from the being being from the the neighborhood, you know, where I can only speak for me, I took the hood over family. My pops yeah. was shit. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And once that once that cat was out the picture, it was the hood. It was it was the homies <laughs> took took that place. That they filled that void for me. Mm -hmm. And watching the older guys, the only way you're going to survive and make it in the hood is to start paying attention to what's really going on and how to react and what fights you pick and choose. And it just made it easier. Going home at night and going to sleep, but then wake up at the crack of dawn and and get that beer and, and you back in the hood doing your thing. Mm -hmm. That was my comfort zone. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? So everything that came with being a gang member, a lot of cats didn't get it. A lot of cats didn't get it. A lot of people thought, a lot of gang bangers thought that robbing, snatching purses, and, and, and all that, that, that extra shit was a part of being a gang member. That's not a part of being a gang member. Being a part of a gang member, being a gang banger is wearing your colors to be recognized and to be ready for war. Mm -hmm. And that 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 sets you different from everything else out there. If you want to go break in the house, that ain't preying on the people that, that ain't gang members. Exactly. I hated that type of shit because that's not what gang banging was about. You know what I'm saying? Snatching an old lady purse, you need to get your ass whooped. But motherfuckers was out there doing their thing that way and then come back in the hood, down they sagging their pants and they this and they that. It's just so different. You know what I'm saying? But the purpose of being, it don't change the fact of the, the shit that we did and the things that I know I destroyed. You know, being a gang member, now there's something totally different. As you get older, you 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 looking at shit like, man. <laughs> You know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. and and I think, I thank God that that I seen it after Alton was killed. I don't seen a whole lot of the homies die. I didn't have him die in my arm. Kenny Tubbs. I, I mean, I watched him take his last breath, but it was nothing like my brother. Seeing my brother at a gas station laying there full of holes. And when we got in the hospital and seeing this shit and, and his eyes still open and they won't let me touch him, I, I threw a nutty. 
Mm-hmm. This is mine right here. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I, I've never been in a situation like that. Yeah. So yeah. it was totally different. And well, kind of interesting. Uh, it just goes back to what we're saying. Like, there was the business about yeah. it until it wasn't just business. Exactly. Until it became personal. We all got to understand there's a flip side to what we yeah. do. And that yeah. usually either takes you uh, that direction, the high road or the low road. Right. You feel me? It's mm-hmm. always that decision. Yeah, you know. And what percentage of those cases go unsolved? Because I think, you know, I, I see mothers on TV and you will hear about the detective solving the case from 20 years ago and the mom was just crying like it's yesterday. I think it's that sense of closure, mm. that feeling of closure, you know, like, OK, this guy's go um, be punished for what he did. I don't know if it's that, because when that guy goes to jail, you still go feel it don't bring nobody back Um what do you think is the you being around that situation, man? What do you think the parents go through? Do you think um, people go through a lot? They go through a lot of mental anguish, man. Um, when did you guys decide to say it's enough? Like we can't do nothing. We can't find this guy. Is it ever really over with? Yeah. Well, you know, we 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 try to exhaust every avenue of investigation. We try to you know, to use every resource available and exhaust it until it either goes cold where you've done everything you can and you just can't make it work. You can't get all the, you know, puzzle pieces to make a picture. And so you're stuck. Um, but other times, other things get involved. You know, you get, there's, there's, you know, there's, there's legal parameters and, and obstacles that you have to overcome. Mm-hmm. You could sit and have really, you, you know what happened, you know, but maybe that confession was illegally obtained. Mm-hmm. Now you can't prosecute that guy, and so there's a it's, it's very complicated um, scenario. But, but ultimately, you know, the gang things were the hardest because of just this culture of the people that knew what happened aren't going to tell you what happened. They're going to go handle talks. right. Mm-hmm. Nobody's saying nothing. Um, it, it's and that's how it's always been in every neighborhood. Even in Cleveland, where we didn't have a gang thing back then, but I heard it's different. I heard they got gangs up there now. Um, even when I was young, you was always taught to mind your business. You don't open your mouth up about nobody's stuff. You know what I mean? So if something happened, if, you know, rooted the pimp on the corner, shot somebody, shot a trick, you was always taught. I didn't see nothing. I don't know, what's, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not talking to you. You didn't even want to. In my neighborhood, you didn't even want to be seen talking to the police. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? The guy had his notepad out back in the day. You don't want to be seen talking to him because you could wind up in a ditch somewhere. So uh, if, if 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 somebody shot your mama in front of you and 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 killed your mama right in front of you and the police ask you who did it, what you going to tell them? I don't know. I'm not going to say. I'm going to say I don't know because I'm going to go kill that motherfucker myself. If I know who did it, okay. I want to go handle this myself because I do think it's a such thing as hood justice. I, I don't want him to go catch him. So, so, so it ain't revenge. Oh, that's yeah, it's revenge for him killing my mama. <laughs> so revenge it like revenge. a motherfucker. It's still revenge. It's revenge. I'm with you. You know, right, my motherfucker yeah. killed my mama. I, I, y- y'all want to try to flip shit? That's revenge, motherfucker. Smoke my mama. I'm gonna tell Greg. I don't know who did it. I'm gonna go get me the biggest pistol I can find and go. And, you go and if I can't get him, I'm gonna probably hit everybody else around him. I'm gonna make him feel the pain because you're well, talking about mama. You know, in a lot of ways, that, that's true justice. And when you think about Orlando killing Tupac, and you think about Poochie killing Big, you know, they didn't go to jail and sit there for years. They got killed on the streets in the same way that they, you know, exacted their own sense of justice on the And so you've got this situation, like for me, that's perfect justice is an eye for an eye. Mm-hmm. You kill somebody, you need to get killed yourself. Well, you- that's... That's right. how it works. It has had to be, and that's biblical. Like, to keep exactly. it all the way 100 with you, that's biblical. It's like, I'm not bothering nobody. I mind my own. But if you come text one of mine, I, I'm going to bring the whole house to Greeks and Trojans and Spartans <laughs> and all the motherfuckers. Shit, you kill a motherfucker, they come in with a thousand ships and I, come I, and I, hit you. I, I got an honest question, Greg. George Floyd. Do you think there's racism is a two part racism in the police department, racist police officers in the police department? And did you think what that officer did to George Floyd just sitting on his neck was right? No, I I can't say that I think it was right. Um, I, I think that there was a lot of contributing factors, though. I don't think that that in and of itself is what got George killed. I I think that there was other things going on physiologically, 
Um, obviously, that die was on his neck way too long, but there was a lot of things that contributed to that death. The whole thing was just a, a, an extremely unfortunate situation. Um, but yeah, I I don't know. I don't know. Chauvin, I think is the pronunciation of that. Shaman. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, I don't know what that guy's perspective is on race. I don't know that man, so I can't speak for him. Obviously, we can speculate. Well, he must be racist because he's kneeling on the, you know, the, the, the neck of the black yeah, guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. My thing is, do you feel, as being a former officer, how do you feel about how uh, you're assigned to different areas? Mm-hmm. You know, how does the process go that gets you to patrol minority areas as opposed to going somewhere like Beverly Hills or whatever. So how is that, you know, uh, played out? Because I feel that sometimes you should evaluate the officers and get the, the uh, try to figure out who should work certain areas. Mm. You should see who has the tolerance to mm. deal with motherfuckers like I used to be as a youth for James or whatever. Mm. Because let's face it, you send a white guy to the area where it's a gang of black niggas and shit like that, it's going to be uprest unless there were certain cops that could come through the neighborhood that we knew that were cool mm-hmm. as opposed to here comes so-and-so. You know we finna get fucked with. So how, do, how does that work to where you know a motherfucker might have this certain attitude towards but then they elect to patrol this area. All right, so I can only speak as it applies to the APD, because that's my experience. Um, it's, it's relatively random. What you, what you do is you put in a wish list for where you want to work. Now, a lot of us, including myself, you know, we wanted to work the, the places that the, were, were the most action was, just because that's the most exciting. Mm. Now, I want to go where things are happening because I want to learn more and have more opportunities to get engaged with, you know, police work. I don't want to work in a sleepy area where I'm just, mm. you know, sitting around waiting for a burglar alarm to go off some rich lady's cats. And, I, you know, I wanted to go and learn and be, you know, I wanted to go and engage. Not in a bad way, but I wanted to go somewhere where police work was active. And, and um, uh, But to your question, it's random. You put in a wish list. I put in, like, I want to work Southwest, 77th, and Newton Division. I ended up in Newton Division in South Central. But all three of those divisions I put in were, were South Central. Mm-hmm. And it was just because that's where most of the action was happening. And as a job, it's more exciting. And so mm-hmm. Just in honesty, it's just more exciting. And so you know, you're more challenged. You get, you know, you have an opportunity to really see what you're made of. Like, how am I going to behave and react in these uh, kind of different environments that I that I wasn't exposed to as a kid? Uh, but it's not in a nefarious way. Mm. It's there just because I want to go and learn. And so, yeah. but I can also to your point though, because I think I know where you're kind of going with this, man. I'm telling you, some of the African African American cops that I work with, mm-hmm. they were. Vicious, probably worse than the on white cops. Yeah, they, exactly. yeah. They so you know, it's a really, it comes down to the individual. And you know, then that's kind of strange, you know, James, because I was trying to elaborate on the George Floyd thing right. and shaving, and you know, the neck situation, and it was obvious you was angry to be in that particular area well, patrolling. This is this is what I believe. I think at the end of the day, before you start your shift, tell me if I'm wrong. Mm-hmm. My my thing is to come home, mm-hmm. but that sets it off. As soon as you get in that car, and you don't know what you're gonna face today on the beat. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So you got some officers. All officers ain't really equipped for it because everybody got a little fear in them. Right. When so. certain things happen, and when when certain things happen, you're not thinking, just like us. You know what I'm saying? But at the end of the day, I'm, I'm going to do my job and I want to go home. But what happens if you get in a situation, a shooting, or or just because that one person had a gun? And a lot of cats are being shot because there's no, ain't no warning shots. We're going to pop this motherfucker because we ain't going to give him a chance 
to shoot us. I'm going home at the end of the day to my wife. So just like when I was speaking about Eric Baradon, he came, he was in the neighborhood, he was working at, at the pool, he was being punked, you know what I'm saying? And now he's a police officer. Now he has a grudge <laughs> against those that, that was punking him. So now being a cop, I got action to get back at him. And then you see that mentality. The mentality is, like you said, it's random. I could choose to yeah. go any fucking way in patrol. I'm going back there because I want to be able to fuck with motherfuckers. So my so my cool. thing again is, and he did that. He got hits with a billy club. No, what 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 happened? I was in a situation. Mm -hmm. It was a shooting, and my stupid ass. You know, I ain't looking back and this and that. They were. I'm in the turning lane, and cats drove up. We in the situation. He's two cars behind me, mm -hmm. and when when they seen it, we hit a, we hit a left. They came right after us. But by but now I'm in jail, and it's all these police officers in the holding tank, and they saying, "Oh yeah, I just caught him red-handed. Woo woo. You ain't caught me doing shit." So he went big on me. But by me knowing Eric, you ain't finna hit me, motherfucker. I don't give a fuck if you is a cop. And it was fortunate for me that Reggie Wright was there, senior, and grabbed me and, and set my ass down. Do you know they finna whoop your ass up in here? And and he had action at that because it's just me in jail faced with all these other police officers. Mm -hmm. But just me being me, I had to lash back at him. You know what I'm saying? Because I know Eric is a weenie. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but the badge had him like, I can do what I want to do to you now. Kirk, now I can get exactly. you. So I was faced. The, the tables turned on me mm -hmm. because now he a cop. He's not a, a, a lifeguard. He's a police officer. But see, he's with his gang now. He has a crew. Okay, so now he got action to, to, to take everything that I did to him and get your punk ass you up. Because and he had me. I can do that. So... Is I know for a fact that it is police officers out there that are are are, are nervous of their jobs. So why pick yeah. to patrol when you know motherfuckers is vicious? So at? that's actually a great point, and I think if there is reform, that is probably you got to do that. You you, you should got never to. be able to work where you. Are going to be encountering people that you, you got a pure grudge against yeah, that. Yeah, you, that, that you just shouldn't. You know, right. just so that's like I'm sense. saying. He took it a point like when he became a cop. He know how greedy it is over there. He know he grew up over there. He made a he made a fucking choice. And when I put this badge on, I want to patrol there. Yeah. So, but then again, so now I'm just kind of probably going to second guess. I I remember working with this guy named Andy Thedford, and he grew up in the neighborhood that he patrolled. And he was a fantastic officer. And he just saw generations of kids, you know, over his 30 year career. And because he knew his neighborhood and he knew a lot of these kids, that's what made him so good. Right. Is because he had a, an insight that guys like me could never have had. Right, like really so, right. Yeah, so it's, a, it's kind of a double edged sword because, you know, you're going back. Yeah, you can have beef with people and try to get even using your badge and your gun and your authority, but at the same time, maybe the best guy is somebody who understands those neighborhoods better than anybody else. Right. Which, so which is good. Yeah. But he used to get his ass well, pumped. He, and it, it, he used and to it, get pumped. It's, it's not because, exactly, he, he used was to get getting pumped. pumped. Now, what if he would have caught me on a bad night walking through the park at Lutus, and then he pulled me over, and then he got me right there? When they go, if he shoot and kill me, this is Mob James. This guy is, look at his record. Look at, damn this is him. So everything is gone. It's justified. It's justified. So my life didn't mean shit at this point because now I'm here. My history is catching up with me. I'm facing a cat that I used to get your bitch, sit your bitch ass down. Y'all going through. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then now here he is. He can do whatever he wants to me. You feel me? So my whole point is that you have police officers that that are that are scared. When they get out there, they drilling, flowing just like mine. Everybody is pumped up. 
do they have that 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 okay I can handle this situation mm-hmm. I know how to handle this situation now like Reggie Wright senior he been in a whole bunch of situations half of the cats put their shit down and you got me Reg you know what I'm saying but the ones that done whoop my ass I'm not giving up to them I can't surrender to them because I know what's gonna happen. Now, I done got beat up so many times in the back of the police car or bent over that car so many times. Oh, he ain't finna catch me. He, I ain't finna let him get me. You know what I'm saying? But all police officers ain't bad, and, and you're a prime example of that. But people don't know. You know what I'm saying? Just like they didn't know that Eric is out here now, but Eric was getting pumped. Mm-hmm. Do we put him in a situation? But they don't know that he's going where cats used to do him like mm-hmm. this. You know what I'm saying? And nobody would never know if I wouldn't have told the story but the ones in the neighborhood. Exactly. This why he killed him. James got killed because Eric was scared of him. Mm-hmm. And, and that James is a real scenario, shit. No, but, 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 but you're a police officer. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And my question, Greg, is and I don't want you, I don't want to put you out there like that to say, I want you to say it. It's all police officers good to be on the force. Do you think they, every police officer has that training to, to be on the streets? Well, certainly not. I mean, you look back at some of the examples of, of guys that uh, just within the LAPD that should never have had badges, the David Max and the Rafael Perez's mm-hmm. and the people that just had no business doing that. But, you know, they were there and we've got to deal with the fact that it's a fallible, it's a, it's a human right. institution and there's fallibility and you're going to have bad seeds, right. you know, and... Uh, unfortunately, in that profession, you just can't afford to have bad seeds because there's so much at stake. And, you know, so, but it's, it's never going to be a perfect equation. We can't have robots. We can't right. have people out there exactly. that can, you know, and, 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 you, and, and fear is a big factor. And, you know, you, you brought up, you were in an environment where being around guns and violence and stuff, you could tether fear because you're exposed to it. And you have cops that aren't exposed to that all of a sudden in, encountering that. Exactly. And that fear goes, you know, through your veins. And so maybe you overreact. It's not necessarily out of like it's some bad intention. It's just you overreact to a situation that you're not fully equipped to deal with. Right. Mm-hmm. Because you didn't grow up in an environment where guns and violence and shit like that was second nature. And now you're there. That's just like going to war. Right. You know, I, I didn't want to be here, but I'm here. This is my job. Mm-hmm. And then now I'm faced with gang members with, with guns. I don't know what they got in this car. And, and I truly believe if I was a police officer, I'm going to walk to the car with my hand on my gun because I don't know. That part is understandable. But you got to know when the time is right. If you're not ready for the time is right, that's why a lot of us is getting killed. You know what I'm saying? Me and Reggie had an issue with how police do certain things when, when you say, I, I, I don't want to speak. I don't. I don't ask questions. Reggie Field, if you don't, if you tell me some shit like that, I'm gonna get mad. Yeah. And now you don't piss me off. Now I'm gonna do this and that to you. Now I want to search your card, whether you got license, insurance, or whatever. Now I'm gonna pull you out and treat you a different kind of way. So it's basically, if you ain't kissing my ass, yes sir, no sir, we gonna have a bad day. Now, what happens when you run into that one police officer that, that's having a bad day and, and come to work because he mad at his wife? Mm-hmm. You in trouble. Mm-hmm. Or you mm-hmm. just run into a gangbanger that really feel like I don't care no more. It's like I look at the whole situation with police like this. Is they, they still human beings. Mm-hmm. Just like you got an asshole that might live next door to you. Right. And he might be the grocery manager. He a grocery manager asshole. That same dude become a cop, he's a cop that's asshole now. You do it, and I think whenever you have that human element, you always go have some kind of room for error. Because like you said, in the robots, like um, they talking about in the L.A. County, you know, um, Sheriff's Department, that it's a gang there called it Executioners. Is. There's a big gang there, and um, apparently this guy, um, Ostroberto Gonzalez, you know, he anonymously put in an anonymous tip that this dude was doing some bad shit. He gets a text on his phone. It's a picture of 
words, he's a snitch on the wall. So now he's scared for his life because he came and dropped the dime. Do you think that that's, and I don't know if you could talk about that or not, Greg, because I know you got a code. You're still a police officer. You can't be, you know, telling on nobody. But how big is that in the law enforcement, like gangs and stuff within the police department? Well, I, I, I wouldn't for me because that term gangs is a specific thing. You know, there's a definition for gangs and it doesn't apply under these situations. And so well, I would say groups. Yeah. So there are groups. So there are these cliques or brotherhoods or these, you know, these kind of fraternal um, type of mentalities. They definitely exist and just like they do in the military. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we do kind of align ourselves under this, like, well, listen, I got your back. We're going to be in this together. We're facing all these, you know, these, these, uh, different situations, but it's not, they're not gangs because gangs means a particular thing to me, Mm -hmm. right? There's a definition for what a gang is and it doesn't apply to that. Um, but certainly this idea that, you know, we need to get these certain tattoos to identify ourselves as part of this, you know, station. Cause that's one of the things that LA County had a big, you know, ordeal. It's like, why are all these guys having these, you know, tattoos put on themselves? See, but because then it starts to, it's, then it starts to fulfill right. those qualifications of what a gang uh, is. What a gang is. And that's what I was going to say, because, mm-hmm. you know, they said that these guys had matching skull tattoos and people in the community see it as a, as a criminal gang within law enforcement, right, you know, right. because they they whooping people's ass. Because I tell you, um, and this is when I had an Escalade, you know, sitting on the twenty twos. You know, how you get off the seven, um, the one hundred five to go on the seventeen. The seventeen was closed off, mm-hmm. so I wound up getting off on like Atlantic or something like that. So I'm going up Atlantic, you know, to go back to the crib. I get pulled over and these dudes snacks baby seats off the back of the car. I'm sitting on the curb and they pretty much told me if we don't find nothing, you can go. I had some 20, you know, speakers, you know, you got your big speakers back in the day. Mm-hmm. They punched the hole in my speaker and said, well, we're trying to find something. Like, pretty much tore my stuff up, right? I asked the dude for his badge number, you know, like I need your name and your badge number. He was just like, you don't need shit. You better just hope we don't find shit. Mm-hmm. And that was that, and they sent me on my way, and I felt real, like, not not to sound like no pussy, but I felt violent. I said, man, these dudes just don't pretty much pull me up a punk, you know, tore up my shit. But they can do it. They, well, and, uh, they, uh, and see, they from do Ohio, it. that's normal fucking wear and tear here. Well, I found that out. Like, you got to remember, this is later on in life, but not to just be on no bougie shit. I don't even look like I'm, no, you know, I'm riding back. I'm coming back from the you're studio. You're a nigga in fucking Linwood. In a fucking Cadillac truck, is, and you is, fit the is, racial profile. Is, is you are profiled. You, you uh, profile. Four cats in the car, two cats in the car, hats on, leaning, music. Let's see what they got. Nine times out of ten, they find something because that's how we roll it. Yeah, they will find. Yeah. They so find a joint. They somebody already, have a gun on them. No, wait a minute. They already know that, but we don't switch it up. You know, at the end of the day, we did because we had the females following us with, with all the goodies. Right. But we rolling cool. <laughs> so when they pull us over, you got your license and bam, they pull you out, they put you in the back seat of their car, they search the car, y'all going to roll. We take off, shoot. And see, that's illegal in itself because when they went all in my, you're not supposed to do that. But we you not. Know, but you ain't supposed to know that as a nigga. You're not supposed to do that. And I told them, I said, dude, you just can't just go on my shit. Shut because- up. And know what they going to do? They going to do shut up. And that's because what they the whole situation is what I'm trying to say is they do that not to disrespect, but they do that because you a nigga dumb from Compton, Long Beach. You ain't supposed to know all that. You ain't supposed to be talking about you ain't you can go in my glove compartment. That's illegal search and seize. You ain't supposed to know because that. The thing is, even if they find t- a hammer in there, a good lawyer gonna beat that case. They gonna yeah, say, give well, "Where was that? It was it's locked in there." You up, and no, then no, they no, no, because the, the thing is, they <laughs> broke the thing because <laughs> I left. I left the middle of that <laughs> thing locked. It was all. It's just locked, right? Mm-hmm. Had a key to it. It was just locked. Mm-hmm. Dude tore the like, like tore. You know them locks ain't that strong. He tore that shit up like like what is he hiding? Like yeah. he's looking for something. And it wasn't no expl- explanation of why I got pulled over. It was just we get over, sit in the curb. Then you know it's like this. And another time I had a dude that um. He was out writing tickets. This is when I stayed in North Long Beach, right? He was out there writing tickets, right? And so 
he told my car for being this much, like a little inch over in the red, right? He didn't tell it. He gave me a ticket, right? I said some smart shit because he was sitting up That's the street. That's why he did it. You know, he was sitting on the smart street. I rolled by him and I pulled out like $5,000. I said, hey, I'm going to get some donuts. You want some? I was stupid. I shouldn't have did that shit. The next day, this motherfucker knocked on my door. I pulled up to the house to go get my wife, right? Because we was going to get our son, you know, from my mother-in-law's house. And he said, by the way, did you know you had a warrant for your arrest? Mm -hmm. And that motherfucker said something like 1022. Get your and I said, for what? And I said, he said, you have a warrant for arrest from 1992. I said, you was a damn lie. I wasn't even driving for 1992. It was a ticket that turned to a warrant, right? Mm -hmm. The thing said Norman Steen. This dude took me down to jail, man. That's when I realized right there, I said, But that's just to give, just, just for the inconvenience that you caused him. When you could have been or, cool. Or he actually thought that that was you who had a warrant. Norman Steen, I wasn't even out here in 92, though. It don't matter. Out here, the mentality, when I, when I was growing up in the hood, that was normal shit. Yeah, I could be riding by my motherfucking self and we'll get see. ready to bust a left or right, and as soon as a motherfucker make eye contact with me, and some of that, is <laughs> and I, you could be clean, no dope, no whatever. It don't matter. Get your ass out, sit on the curve, and let me tear up everything. And then when I don't find nothing, you thank me, motherfucker. But you got to look at it too, like this: hey, being in the hood. They know who you are. You're already profiled. Exactly. Anybody that signed that card, the first they, they, they that card out. They know who you is. So when they see you, they already know what type of person you is. They, we just might find something on this dude today. Nine times out of ten, that's what they're going on. Exactly. Half of the half of the shit that we do, getting pissed off, we know we can't win. I learned this a long time ago. Just say okay. Just keep your hands on the car. Don't put your hands in your pocket. That's a sign. That's a gesture that what the fuck you doing? Talking shit to him ain't finna get you nowhere. Nine times out of ten is is a small infraction turns into getting your ass whooped, kicked on the ground, the whole nine. When all I had to do is just go back. When I tell you that them dudes that came back to the crib, right? Because he taking me outside, and I'm telling them, dude, I wasn't here in 1992. I was in college because I came here in '88. Went to Long Beach City College, got a scholarship somewhere, and I'm over there during that time, you know, the second two years. So I'm like, I wasn't even here, you know what I mean? So how you gonna tell me I, I got a warrant for my arrest? But when I tell you, whatever he whispered in that microphone, it's about 40 motherfuckers popped up. Because you was and a big they motherfucker, they had me and he was ready to get you. They had me surround, let me tell we you might that. have a problem. <laughs> Them motherfuckers yeah. was reaching for their billy club. I saw this one dude, this Mexican dude, like he was just waiting to tear my ass up like a piñata. So, you, the, so you're seeing this whole scenario through your eyes. That guy doesn't know that you weren't here. Right. In his mind, he's just processing information, trying to make you know, try, trying to make sense of it all. And he might think this warrant is yours, so he has to go through a certain procedure. He doesn't know you weren't here. You know you weren't here, mm -hmm. and that's but why Greg, it doesn't make sense to you. So when they when they call a certain warrant or whatever, the height, the weight, and everything shows up. Yeah, it should. The warrant, but, you know, if it's a 10-year-old warrant, how much can change in 10 years? Shit, his height. Well, no, I'm just saying that, that those things need to be taken into consideration. If I pulled you over and it says uh, 5'10", I'm like, well, clearly there's a problem here. Right. Right? So, yeah, I'm already going to be like, this probably isn't you. But if there are consistencies, then I have to go through the process. If Because I can't assume he's telling me the truth. Right. Well, the judge said right? this is an outcast. He got looked at the ticket and got mad as hell. He dismissed it. But it was an inconvenience for me because I had to bail out. I never got that money back. But, the, but yeah. that's what it was for. I had to bail you should have got it back. It was mm -hmm. the, I never get no money back. It was back. the inconvenience you. It was just being a smart ass the other day by rolling by showing your bank Yeah, yeah I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that. We have enough stuff that we can do where we're not going to spend a whole bunch of time just trying to inconvenience you because we can go out and do our job, find the other things to do. To take you to the station and find out that it's not really you, that's a pain in the ass. Yeah, right? but see, that's coming from a cop like you who's on the up and up. A motherfucker like the dude that y'all used to punk and a motherfucker that you showing your bankroll to, mm -hmm. I'm finna find a reason to fuck with you. Fair enough. Straight up. Right. It got nothing to do with it. Yeah, of course. We got plenty of fucking shits we could be doing than the fucking with you. Mm -hmm. But you want to be an asshole 
and and I'm already in this 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 element of bangers and drug dealers and motherfuckers I don't really get down with. So the code is, motherfucker, shut up and don't say shit because I'm just an asshole and I see your car is in the red by ten inches. I could be like him and be like, hey, dude, move your car. Or I could be like his cop and go. You got a ticket. Mm -hmm. And then when you want to come by and go, yeah, I'm going to go get some donuts. Okay, motherfucker. <laughs> I'm going to get on my computer and find a motherfucker that fits your description and close to you. <laughs> and I'm coming back and take your ass to you. Do I know it Just ain't you? Just to put him in jail. You fucking right I know it ain't you. But the inconvenience to pull you out of that motherfucker because you doing all of this, now convenience your ass and go and spend that shit you, on the bail. And, and when out. I tell you that this dude drove by my house all the time, mean mugging me. <laughs> I feel like the biggest bitch in the world. He's right around like this. Just mean motherfucker like this. And do something else. Do something else. Do something else. And I'm going to find another right. robber and smell, and I'm going to stick his ass to you and see you right back and there. I can, and I can't do shit but keep watering the grass and act like I'm not looking at him. I used to be mad as hell. Well, y'all got it. Y'all had what you call him. I used to go in the house and open the windows, roll them windows out, and tell bring your bitch ass in here. I used to make comfort, man, motherfucker. Come on in there, motherfucker. I dare you. Well, come on outside, James, and let's let's talk. Nigga, do you think I'm stupid? I used to fuck with them all the time. They came to my house and uh, talk about I just did a robbery. And uh, we out there partying. This one I have parties every every weekend. They told me I had to shut it down. I don't have a license for it. Man, I put the lock on the gate. Everybody inside. Man, fuck with y'all talking. They came back, said it was a robbery. I fit the description. They went in the house. They found two pistols. And they wouldn't mind, but they found the two pistols. And uh, I go to jail, and Reggie said, this ain't, what, what, what are you in there for? And that was one good thing about Reggie Wright Sr. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I totally don't fit the description of these motherfuckers, but I had police officers that just, just didn't like me. And Reggie Wright, a, that's a good example for a guy who... Who worked where he lived? Or right, worked where he came exactly. From. exactly. Yeah, community so, yeah. policing. Yeah, and that was a good thing. That, that, that's what I think yeah. that should be, you know, sort of a, a inherited mm -hmm. into motherfuckers joining the force or whatever. I, I need to know why you want to patrol in Compton, mm -hmm. being who you are. Mm -hmm. But is that contradicting because the 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 brother police officer, the black. Police officers, they was harder than the white boys. You got there. They was harder right. than the Mexicans. Because a lot of them was punked ass motherfuckers. 80% of them punked. Whoops, my ass. And now they want to come back to a place where they can punk the next You had a lot of enemies. You had a lot yeah, of revenge again. Revenge again. That's what I'm going for. Oh, motherfucker, motherfucker, grow up, get his ass kicked, getting pumped. You can't get in the motherfucking sit your ass down. You can't get in the pool right now. Now I'm gonna grow up and I'm gonna join the force. And when they ask me where I want to patrol, like Lutus Park is where I want to fucking back patrol. To my God damn it! The first thing I do when I put that badge on, you I'm gonna look for fucking James McDonald. And they gonna fuck that shit. Your ass I mean, I'm going down shit. this motherfuckers. No, no. I'm going down your street right now, nigga, in my and, car. And, like, and that would have been cool. Y'all been a 6 4 motherfucking date. I'm coming down God, the street in that motherfucking patrol car, and I'm just rolling looking at your ass in the yep. front yard. Like, mm, and Eric, the night shift. Like, mm, <laughs> Eric would have had to do what he had to do if that would have ever happened because I ain't finna let him punk me. You know what I'm saying? But then you would have no one in the police. No, but, but, see, but he probably wanted that. It James. wasn't too. No, he wouldn't have got it. He wouldn't have got it. But that he didn't get it in the police station. Excuse when to go, the odds was, was totally against me. Give me his excuse yeah. when it was totally against me, and and I wouldn't finna give him that satisfaction. I couldn't. I wouldn't give a fuck if I was scared as fuck because I know they finna whoop my ass. I couldn't give him that. Yeah, and, and that's crazy. You can give them that satisfaction. You know, Greg, I, I want to get back to the murders real quick because it's a couple of my, what I'm really trying to find out, man, is why is California murder rate so high compared to these other places? But what I wanted to ask you, I wanted to go back to one, a real famous one that might have happened not too long ago. Rest in peace. Nipsey Hussle. What did you think about that whole thing? Well, again, so this goes back to the idea that, you know, if you have a high profile name, you're going to get more resources dumped into the investigative effort. And so because he was somebody that was a, a, a notable figure and um, there was a, a lot of pressure to solve that, a lot of, you know, it, it went to robbery homicide. It, it, 
Otherwise, if it was just a random gangster, it would have stayed divisional with the homicide investigators, who are already taxed because they've got a bunch of other homicides to investigate, right? So then it goes to a specialized unit like Robbery Homicide Division where they can just dump tons of resources and manpower into it. And so that's why, you know, it got solved relatively quickly. Um, and as my old partner, Darren Dupree, you know, worked on that case and mm -hmm. as he, he worked on Pop Smoke. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you've... And when you say the resources that mm -hmm. are provided, mm -hmm. is that financial? Is that Mostly. just... So basically... Yeah. The money basically falls where the high-profile case goes, right. as opposed to Nipsey being just a regular homie from '60s right. and got popped. Nobody's offering fifty thousand dollar rewards for information. There's no money for going, getting up on emergency wiretaps, which are really mm. expensive. Mm. Paying informants. There's a whole bunch of different avenues of investigation that cost money that you're not going to spend on just some. Hold some, on, let me go back to that. Paying informants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that is true. Dudes oh, yeah. make a living. Oh, Snitching like a motherfucker. How much, how, much the informants, how much the informants get paid? Well, if you're a federal informant, if you're working for one of the, you know, the DEA or the FBI, you're making pretty good money because they have, you know, they have a, a deeper pockets. An LAPD informant, if you're buying dope, you're just you're barely making enough to get through the week. Mm -hmm. You know, so it just really depends on what type of work you're doing and for who. So they just got a budget. Is that what they do with all the dope that they seize when that money comes up missing when they take that money? So there's a so if you're an informant working for the DEA and you you know assist in an investigation that leads to a hundred million dollars in asset forfeiture asset forfeiture seizures, mm -hmm. you know you're you you are potentially entitled to ten percent of that of what they seize. Really? So if yeah. you seize, so if you are the informant. The, is, that you know, busts the Tony Montana's and he got the mansions and the Rolls Royces <laughs> and all that shit. Money. So being an ah. informant, you can you can actually live and get to buy your own island if you get the right. You go, you go snitch it on the big top motherfuckers and get your ten percent commission, <laughs> motherfucker. You shit, you that chilling like that, a motherfucker. That's crazy, but the money that 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 the government sees, they take that money and put it right back into. That's the resources that they have. It goes back into drug enforcement operations. Mm. So it just funds all, because it's super expensive. You know, getting up on a wiretap, you know, um, you know, all these monitors and all of these people that are typing things, it's really expensive. So why does they say they broke and they don't, they don't have the resources to go after this person or that person? When every case they have in seizing cars and houses and all that, which are sold, that money for goes pennies on the dollar, by the way. You know, a lot of that stuff isn't sold for what it's actually worth because mm -hmm. the government doesn't want to be taxed or help. You know, they don't it want look, to. It, it makes them look like get rid of this shit. Yeah, okay. you know? mm. And so it's it's sold uh, for much less than it's actually worth. And then, but if they're if they're just actual, you know, um, cash seizures, you know, if you stumble on a million dollars, that you know, most of that just goes right back into the process of investigating. It goes right back to feed the. Uh, the effort. Yeah, and I know a lot of that money come up missing before it even hit the station too. Because <laughs> again, you got the human element. You know what I mean? Um, you know, let's go back to the pop smoke thing. Um, with technology, man, are you think the police department is seeing more people like with the pop smoke incident? He was on Instagram. You know, his location is on. That's what people don't know. When you put a picture up, sometimes if you don't have your settings on the phone the right way, if somebody got the right software, they can tell where you took the picture at. It, it gets even more interesting than that. Like they, it's called geofencing, and what happens is that if there's a crime scene, and the police department has the capability of putting a fence around a certain vicinity, and they can capture everything that's getting tweeted, everything that's getting Facebooked, everything that's being communicated, is and, and so you can then digital. If, if 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 some witness from their window sees a murder go down, she says, "Man, I just saw that guy." Just, and then they can go and talk to her. Wow, you know, so you hey, guys can pinpoint you just tweeted like that? this out. You just tweeted this out. Did you actually see this or not? You know, and sometimes it's like, no, I did not. So do it. they do that just randomly or it happens when a crime scene happens? It happens when it's a crime scene of significant 
uh, significant. Um, so they can put up a digital fence and basically go back. It's just like uh, reading a cell tower, right. going in, bingo. Exactly. So they can put up this fence in this perimeter mm -hmm. and just basically just start pulling up everything from the last five hours. Like, oh, she tweeted. Then. Well, they surfed the internet anyway, Facebook mm -hmm. and well, all that crazy. anyway. That's, and yeah. I hope you kids out here hear all this, you know, because the thing is, like I tell people today, man, it's almost impossible to get away with some shit. It is, it's almost impossible because the thing is, if you go smoke somebody, you happen to have your cell phone in your pocket, mm -hmm. and they ask you, um, where were you at in this? And you talk about, man, I was in Corona doing this. And they say, well, we have your cell phone, you know, being tracked over on the east side of Compton. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That night. So it's almost impossible, man, because the way they got Pop smoked, man, you know, he was in Beverly Hills, and the door got kicked in. And now, see, I look at that as something. They was coming to get him directly because they didn't take nothing. Nothing, you know, they didn't steal nothing, so it wasn't like it was just a regular home invasion robbery. They didn't take shit. They left all the jury with them. They just went and killed them. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me tell you something. A, a, a lot of these cats are being killed. It's inside shit. If if you walk in with a stack of money, if you hanging out with a stack of money, and you ain't spreading that stack of money amongst mm -hmm. us, mm -hmm. somebody out of that five or somebody out of that group, period, is gonna set you up. That's a hundred racks, man. We can eat up that for. We can do what with that. That's all that happened to him, and and the majority of the other motherfuckers. See, we do this shit to each other once again. So that's all that happens. You out here just like the little cat that was in yeah, that was Hollywood in with us, and with and him. he had these eighty racks on him, and mm -hmm. he taking pictures and all of this, and they gambling. Bet five thousand, bet ten thousand. I'm talking about they got. Well, he had more than eighty, James. You gotta remember, he lost fifty no. to Fat Boy. He had eighty sitting there. Oh, yeah, he said he's sitting there, eighty thousand sitting there. Yeah, and he, and he still got a backpack full of money. You don't know me from Jack. Now, if I was like starving twenty years, yeah, twenty years ago. It'd have hey, been over. I'd have been on the phone right now. Listen, myself. get up here right now. Hey, hey my nigga, uh, <laughs> and, I'm, and, about to, I'm about to go, but I'm going to get y'all this and address this right here. So they in here with a hundred in the back. We quit the flow show and show what we got going on. You got cash. You got to remember, you got people out here that are starving. Oh, yeah. You got brothers out here that will get you for that paper. So if you if you profiling like that and then you you on you on Instagram you on Facebook you going live they know you right there they know I, what you I think doing. it goes back to the to the just what I was saying like the other day um, when I grew up we had a certain code of the not flossiness yeah. you feel me today it's the mainstay for the young cats. All of them do it. Just the money to the ear, the $2 million of ice on, you know, because to them, that represents respect mm -hmm. from other motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? In our days, the respect came from who you was exactly. and what you could do with these or right. who you was in the hood. Mm -hmm. Period. And give a fuck. You didn't have to be, I didn't have to be the big time fucking drug dealer. Nigga, don't, nigga know me, period. You get me? That's the respect we had back in Kegis the day. in the t-shirt. Right. That's it. We didn't have to. Man, man, let me go to the motherfucking swap meet and buy me up a gang of Turkish ropes and do all. We had a few drug dealers and ballers who did that shit. But for the majority, niggas had names just a whole fool they are. We, now the respect code and who you demand if you show up with a billion chains on. And then you taking pictures with the phone to your ear. Mm -hmm. And you get me? Like, like my nigga James said. It's niggas still starving in Compton. It's a nigga next to you starving. You might have bought a nigga an outfit or got him some shoes that look like you and that's their homie. Wait, but no, he ain't got but fucking $20 in his pocket. And you sitting over here with fucking, uh, fucking half a million in your lap and like this. That causes jealousy. Come on, man. Well, this, this, that. well this story has ended. I'm sorry, James. This story has ended no one. Uh, he was up in there gambling with Fat Boy. Uh, James talked to him and told him, be careful. Right. I talked to him. He showed me a little nine millimeter he had in his back. Well, I got some OG, somebody coming here. And I said, man, that's not going to do shit. I said, I know some motherfuckers that come here with a 22 and lay everybody down in this motherfucker before somebody. And they just blend in because it's people, they don't know if they with us. 
We don't know if he with the other people. So there's somebody could be in there just blending and not know nobody. And all it takes is one motherfucker get hit. Once a motherfucker hit that pop, everybody gonna get the scattering. Everybody will get the fall on the floor and shit. Cause ain't nobody in the outside. And, you know, us go do shit. They go fall on the floor. And I said, you could lose your life. I said, I can call somebody right now and tell them to come up here, hit me in the head to make it look good. You know It'll what I'm saying? A week, a week after he left there. Oh yeah, a week after this man left there. He was in D.C. gambling. It was online, all on camera. He was in D.C. gambling. Got killed. And when I tell you how he got killed, it was on there. They had guns, like they were showing off their little guns and stuff. Dude tried to pull an AK out the back of the car and went to shoot it, and he didn't know what the hell he was doing. And you just saw him backing up, and there was some dudes. Whoever them other dudes was, they knew what they was doing because them dudes was backing up. I saw the one dude drop the AK and get shot up in the back. You know what I mean? Because he didn't know how to use it. They had all them tools, but didn't know how to use it. But he died out there in D.C. behind the same thing, shooting dice. And because he, somebody said, it's a motherfucker up here with a bag of money. Come and get this motherfucker. Mm -hmm. Shit, I'll be the nigga right there with you gambling and go like, shit, this nigga got a bag of motherfucking money. <laughs> and that happened this a lot of times. This nigga don't know me from a can of paint. It happened nigga, lay down time. right now. <laughs> Fuck this shit. And, 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 and for real, for real, this, this is nothing new. And this is how we've been doing each other from the beginning. When the dope came, when the dope came and that certain individual came up and you still doing the 20s and the uh -huh. buying them 50 packs, Man, I'm wasting my time. Now you got the homies kicking it. Homie then got killed. They done stole, took everything inside job. So we do this shit to ourselves. And then now here we have Black Lives Matter. Why in the hell is we getting mad? And I'm going to keep saying this on every show. Why are we getting mad when the police? It's, we, we supposed to, but why we ain't trying to fix the shit ourselves? Instead of saying, okay, the police, we killing each other more than they doing it. Yeah. But it don't make it right that they doing it. But let's be mad at ourselves first. We can't fix nothing blaming everybody else. And 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 we finna get that going. And this is where we at. Because we've been doing this shit from the beginning of time. Exactly. Doing each other. Mm -hmm. From the beginning of time. And, yeah, and it's still some jealousy. Um I can't stand to see, hey, why the fuck did he make it as a rapper? Fuck him, who the fuck do he think he is? And you could be coming back just on some regular, regular stuff, just coming back to see your people. You know, you miss the neighborhood. You coming back to hang out with some friends, right? Them same people looking at you like, who the fuck he think he is? He came to show out. Look at his chain. And you might not be me thinking about that. You know what I mean? But that's why I said that's the mentality of the motherfucker who hasn't succeeded or who's still in the neighborhood with that mentality. Right. Like I said, I got shit motherfuckers today from the hood. Still well, talk hey, shit. Some of the, some of us will never get out the neighborhood. No. A, a, a fact. Some of us truly believe that I'm stuck. I don't want no difference, don't see no difference, don't want to go nowhere. And that's the crazy part about it. Man, I was happy to get up out of here. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You you get tired of it, but some cats, like the older cats, like older than me, if you're still in the neighborhood, I can't knock them for still being in the neighborhood mm -hmm. because I didn't have a they don't they didn't have a a norm still to make a phone call to them. Man, I I, I want to do a show. I want to do this. They didn't have a Greg Kading to say, man, you have an interesting story. Man, you want to go to Australia? What Australia? Mm -hmm. Damn, I don't think I'm gonna be able to get a passport. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we don't, everybody don't get those outs. You know what I'm saying? So everything is going to still be what it is. But we got to get inside the neighborhood and then get at the little youngsters and say, come on, man, this ain't what y'all doing. That's why we're doing the podcast to let, to inform those that think it's cool to be a gangster and all of that. That's not what's happening. Here you got MC8. He done did his thing and, and bam. Should he have somebody targeting him because, oh, man, I know he got a lot of money. No. Come on, man. Don't tear me down because you, you don't want it. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. And it's almost like subconsciously somebody is looking at you and blaming you for their misfortune kind of. Yeah, that happens. You know, and it's like in their head, they've justified that. Man, who the fuck James think he is up there talking? Man, I did more shit than he did. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, people are crazy, man. Our jealousy and envy within our own people is 
been at an all time high. And I uh, never cared. And like James said, um, a lot of people want to blame the police. And of course, it's wrong mm-hmm. to be in a, a George Floyd situation or Breonna Taylor or anybody that we feel that may have lost their lives by, you know, police brutality or whatever. But then it, again, like he said, We've been gangbanging for years, smoking each other, Bloods and Crips and the the, the SA homies and in, 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 in the brown and the minorities and the Asian gang. And we've been killing each other before Black Lives Matter. So I understand people want to rally behind something. You understand? You know, that's how we. I feel we are as a people, too. You know how niggas are as a people, you know. You, something come out, we all flock to that shit. You give me the the latest trend, we flock. You know, we all got to do this shit. All oh, every and look for somebody to blame. But like you said, motherfucking go tomorrow and smoke up the next nigga from the enemy hood across the street, and we don't have no marches. You know, we might got a little a couple of moms out there who grieve and a couple of, but for the most part, shit, it's ordinary. What's well, what you, tell you, what you this, do, man? Um, and this is my honest opinion. Because in every neighborhood, you still have some OGs who give a damn. The dude that don't been in the pen for a long time. You have a lot of them that do. Yeah, and this don't make no sense. This don't make no sense what's going on. If you had them dudes start holding on court to the idiot that get in the car, hop in the car, and just start randomly shooting at people to kill four or five kids, I bet you if they had to deal with those people, man, on certain a certain kind of level, you do some dumb shit over here, we go discipline your ass. You know what I'm saying? I bet you all that shit would cut down. No, this is the flip side to it. You kind of keep it in the house like Yeah, that. keep it in the house. I bet you motherfuckers are lying You up. can, but the, the youngsters out here today ain't respecting the OGs. They, they, don't, they, don't, don't, they don't have it how we had it when we grew up. They, they'll kill an OG. Then you got some OGs don't want to deal with these youngsters because they might have to kill one of these little cats. Now he's back in jail. You know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like a, a a flip side to it because if I get involved with these little cats and they ain't listening to me, they already know I'm going to knock them upside the head. Now I knock them upside the head. Now I got to worry about this little cat coming back and popping out the bushes and shoot me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because he damn so coming back. Exactly. So it's, it's just a you need more than a big homie in the hood. You need cats like like... You have the East Coast and all of these other, where there's a lot of them, seven, six, whatever. You need all them cats to get together and then get at each other. Everybody got to come as one in the neighborhood and then say, whoop, wham, bam. You have to be active to stop it. You have to be the big homie in the hood that's with it to stop it. Not an OG that's kicking it with his wife and now, I mean, y'all, this ain't how we used to do it. You can't have it like that. You got to have somebody that was active, like really in there to to, to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. Instead of the, the way Nipsey did it. Nipsey was involved in everything and everybody in it. And you know, half of those, half of those cats didn't like the way he was doing certain shit. So you was, you gonna run into some resistance, mm-hmm. but you have to do it like in hood. You got to be in the hood. You got to really be with it for those little cats to understand and respect you. You know what I'm saying? And respect the game. So me personally, me, I say knock them off, get them out the way because they don't want to listen, but you'll be killing down to everybody. Yeah, you know? then you kind of, it's like a kind of a, um, a hypocritical thing is you seeing no black and black crime, but the little mm-hmm. homies is disappearing. You know, so I, I, I see your point. Um, what I think is this, man, what people don't look at, man, we just can't sit up and blame us, man. California, like we, we do, got to sit up and blame yeah, us. We have to blame us, but we put in certain conditions, man, to where we are almost conditioned. And I'm not one of those people to make excuses, but we are almost conditioned to hate each other. Obviously, you um, don't agree with me. Beginning of the time, yeah, it, it's like almost like it's just uh, been that way for as long as I remember. Me. I mean, but you really don't, as a kid, I mean, I went to school with a lot of niggas who end up enemies from different neighborhoods. I mean, it's just like a motherfucker being taught racism. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of children, a lot of white kids or whatever, they don't grow up or born with the, 
I don't like that motherfucker. Well, Let's that's what, talk. But that's what conditioning so, is. My conditioning is training somebody up in some market. In my, in my conditioning, James, whatever, you know, my condition as a young gangbanger was I'm from this hood. We got beef with them. My conditioning is you follow the code and you beef. It, it, it wasn't the I was born with it because five years ago when we went to elementary, me and this nigga playing kickball with each other. Right. And then when it's time to go to junior high, he go up the street to that school and I go around the corner. They banging this over here and they banging that over there with the neighborhood structure. So now my friends become them. I wasn't born to hate him, but now that I'm running with them, since the Hatfields and McCoys, they've been hating that neighborhood. I'm over here now. So that's my conditioning. My condition is I want to be a part of Trag New Park. So fucking, we don't like them. So if you want to be long, your conditioning motherfuckers, you hate everything about them. Mm-hmm. Period. Whether that, and, and a lot of the shit is, I got a cousin over there, a relative. I got to be mad at my cousin and relative. Yeah, Nigga, you from up. the hood? We don't, we don't fuck with them. That's your conditioning of what I was brought up. So you have to be able to change that structure. And like you said, James said, we got to be, it got to be OGs in the hood who changes that structure and that mentality of conditioning the young homies to we beef with the eight nines or we beef with the mob or we beef with them. So it's that mentality that has to be changed, yeah. I feel. It's just like saying getting rid of the police. What, what do you think happens? If you get rid of the police, if you get rid of the police, that tells me I can go kill any motherfucker mm-hmm. I want to. You got to have them. Yeah. How do you how do you get around that? So we got to be one hundred with ourselves and, and what the fuck we doing. We got to take accountability for the shit that we doing. That's why I say it's important for me to try to save one of these little youngsters. We 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 we. I mean. If we don't step up, then everything stays the same. Exactly. If we don't show or say, everything stays the same. So instead of talking about it, man, we got to figure out a way to fix it. Mm-hmm. I think it'll go better for for the the especially the police that's really there to fix shit, mm-hmm. opposed to the ones that come to work just so he can see how many motherfuckers ass he can work. And I think that's the average cop. I think the average cop goes to work with good intentions. And they just want to get home with their family because another another thing that we have to stop doing, because I hate when I see this, I train my sons because the world is just the way it is. When they first started driving, if an officer pulls you over, you keep your hand on the wheel, be respectful, don't be muffing off to them. Keep your hand there, give them your driver's license. If something happens, I'd rather bail you out than bury you. Right. You know, so just do what you're supposed to do. Keep your hands on the steering wheel and... um. I think that's the average cop, though, that, that has good intentions. And I, I hate when I see us officers sometimes be being cool as hell. He pulls somebody over. They got the window up this side. What are you pulling me over for? What the fuck do you want well, to that's, that's the new narrative yeah. of, the, of the clout. Yeah, yeah. Of how they call yeah, the clout yeah, chasers. Yeah, the clout chasers. Yeah, so they got the camera. And you can see this officer is being cool as hell, right? And you got a motherfuckers in here giving them blues. It's just like the one brother that got shot in his back. Somebody was, you know, I kind of walked in on the conversation of one of my partner's house, right? He was like, this is so fucked up. They shot the homie. Look how they shot him. And I said, well, man, it looked like he running in the car reaching for some shit. What the fuck else were they supposed to do? You know, don't get me wrong. I hate that that brother lost his life. I feel bad for well, his no, kids. There's a lot of things they could have did because they tased him first. If they tased him, that should have been it right there. You get on him. You, you handcuff him. And you 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 got the situation under control. Yeah, that's it. But how that wasn't this take, case because, man, because that you, officer didn't make this dude run around the car and go reach. Like, what are you reaching well, for? He not yeah. listening. Go ahead. Yeah, come well, on. Well, no, no. But to your point, James, they t- they tased him and it didn't work. Yeah, that's but they the should have. So when they tased him, they should have took him down. Well, you would hope. But if the taser doesn't work to where he's incapacitated, you're not going to run up and try to tackle a guy with a knife in his hand. He didn't have a knife in his He absolutely did. I guarantee fucking tea. Did he? Absolutely. And you're not see, that's what I mean. There's more to the shit than what yeah, everybody knows. Absolutely. He's armed with a knife. And he said it. I've got a knife. And there's a fucking knife in his hand. 
And, you know, you're not going to run up and try to tackle somebody like that, right? Right. So the taser, because they know this, we're keeping our distance. Well, that's not working. Now he's running away. We're going to chase him. Now he's running and reaching in the car of a, that doesn't even belong to him, and there's kids in there. So it's, it gets really complicated. Oh, that was in his car? No. That he opened he, the door to? He reached in the car. He didn't open What I heard was there was another domestic situation going right. on. He came up to defuse the domestic situation. When the police pulled up, automatically it's an escalation or whatever, whatever. They see him there, everybody's whatever. So, hey, what's going on? Whatever, yeah. whatever. Now, I never heard a story about a knife or whatever. Yeah, no, he, the, the domestic was the, the, the old lady that he had a, restra <laughs> had a restraining order against him. Okay. So this was all, this was not a random thing where he was getting involved in somebody else's business. Right. This was his well, business. Well, they said it was a domestic. Yeah. So, Everybody is feeling uneasy because it's Black Lives Matter and mm -hmm. George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. So, so naturally, when you see incidents that involves a black person and a white cop, it's automatically going to be escalated to uh, the black on white, fuck the police type of whatever situation that's been going on. So nobody really wants to look and see what's happening. And like and, and people questions or oh, why they didn't do this or why they do that or why I even let him get to the fucking car in the first place. And then it's horrifying because now the realization is you shot him fucking six times. But even with a knife, are you trained to 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 take something, a weapon from a, a person? Yeah, so typically like there's this is part of the police training. You learn how quickly somebody can cover ground. And, you know, and if you're eight, 10 feet away from me, by the time I process information and make a decision to shoot, you can get to me that fast. You know, you can get to me before I've figured out, shit, he's running at me, he's got, and all of a sudden, I'm trying to defend myself and you already got your knife in my throat. I mean, it's that fast, James. It's really, this shit happens so fast. And we have to do this thing, you know, we have to take into consideration response time. And it is, there's, there's seconds involved. And, and when you start to consider that and you're trained, that this guy can cover ground really quick. And so if, if you feel like he's gonna advance on you and he's right there and you're in fear for your life, you have to do what you gotta do to, to protect yourself. I know that we can sit here and look at it like, well, it's just a knife and he's 10 feet away, 12 feet away. Man, you can cover that ground really quick and it's been proven. They, they do all kinds of training on this. Mm. And so, you know, you've got to, when you're processing information and the decision will, shit, he's running at me, he has a knife and pull your trigger. That's all the time it takes for him to get to you. Right. Yeah, it's and, quick. And this, go, go ahead. Okay. I want to ask uh, to elaborate on the situation about what you can control as an officer in your situation. Um, in your training, or you as an officer, what is your first thought when you're in that situation? Is it to kill a motherfucker, you know, not so graphic, right. or should I take one pop in the leg or something to wound a motherfucker? Because it seems to us, or some people, Shooting a bop, 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 bop is a little bit extensive. Right. Then to It's a little extensive than to just, okay, the motherfucker's reaching and getting his car, mm -hmm. bop, and then let me see what's happening. Let me pop him in the ass or shoot him in the leg as right. opposed to, I'm just going to bust six shots at his back and bing, bing. Right. What's the training process that you, as being a cop in that situation, deal with? Yeah, Knowing that, it's Black Lives Matter and it's you get me? I don't How think do you, you think about that, that shit when you out there working, man? I wouldn't think about it. In the moment, you're not thinking about that, but I think that's a fan, that's really a great question because I, you know, and I've always personally t had 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 a I had a beef with the the way that we do this. Like we do two shots to the chest, one to the head, right? Double tap. And if the two shot if the two shots to the chest don't work, because this is center mass, is the easiest thing to hit. It's really hard to like shoot somebody in a kneecap or, you know, to take a very, you know, shooting's much more difficult than you think. Most shootings happen within 10, shit, in 10 feet, you still miss, you know? 
Uh, you look at police shootings and more times than not, you're missing your target because, and they're only 10, 12, 15 feet away. And so the, the training is center mass. The easiest thing to hit is right in the middle of this picture. And then if that doesn't work, then you try to do a failure drill, which is to hit him in the head because that's going to stop him. If those first two shots don't work, then you go to where you know it's going to stop him. And until you've seen people who have been shot and still continue to advance and still continue to fight, and you start to appreciate, like, you know, there's... But to your point, like, I think if given the opportunity, you should take that selective shot. If you have that chance and a guy's got a knife, put one in his leg. It's kind of crazy that, you, you know, so you're trained mm -hmm. and the first thought is, regardless of the fucking situation... The traffic stop or whatever, but if it escalates to something, the right. first trained is bop, bop, chest, bop, head. Mm -hmm. Like, fuck it. This motherfucker is right. obviously drunk or obviously mentally whatever. Mm -hmm. So fuck it. Bop, bop. You know, but you, we're trained to center mass, bing, bing. And if right. that don't work, fuck it. Bing. No right. question. You know, but so, then you got to so look the, at the, it, though. The My language is, is, is dangerous. But I'm saying... How do you depict that from a situation that you know a motherfucker drunk? And I know if this motherfucker wasn't drunk, he wouldn't probably be trying to come at me. So do I want to kill this motherfucker because he don't know what's going on? Let me ask you this. And by the way, though, that happens all the time. I mean, there's all kinds of these situations where they're like, this this guy's just not right in his mind. And he's not, pro you know, it, even though he's a threat because he's got a gun or, or I'm sorry, he's got a knife most likely. He's got a baseball bat, whatever. He's got a weapon. And but you just know that he's out of, you know, and so you do your best to try to figure that out. But once he becomes like an imminent threat where he's rushing you, then you got to deal with that. And, you know, whether it's in, in the thing, the easiest thing is to put two into his chest. And what's so fucked up about that, not to cut you off, James, or whatever. But we see in so many situations, mm -hmm. put a white guy in the same situation and you see it all day. That motherfucker ran at him, he chased him around the car and they like, hey, hey man, come on, stop, we're gonna shoot. You, you, you. But then when they come put somebody of his color in the place and it's instant, bop, bop, well, See, I'll bop. tell you the biggest yeah. difference with that eight, and not to cut you off, but this is what I think. That white guy that's out there acting crazy, mm -hmm. they're not really scared of him. When they pull you over, they already got a mind. They mind, man. I might get murdered fucking with this motherfucker. So I'm not playing with him. See, see, that's kind of that's kind of that's kind of fucked and what up. What they for do me is to... use more caution yeah. with certain individuals that they deal with, and and unfortunately, it's me. I'm the one with the name. I'm the one that they got to worry about. Uh, uh, Tom and Joe, what these motherfuckers doing over here? So nine times out of ten, that stop is not going to be as severe as. Damn, I got it. Look what they did to you. That's a big motherfucker right there. So is that 10, 33, 4, 4, 4, 5. We got a big motherfucker here. This motherfucker might want to fight. So they got to call for backup and prepare themselves to take you down. Because the way But is that a decision that you personally make? Is that a decision you make in that situation? If you see a white guy or a black guy or a Mexican or what mm -hmm. in the same scenario, mm -hmm. do you make that personal to go, I'm going to handle this black guy? differently than I handle this white guy or this and it's like three different scenarios but they're all the same scenario yeah no not for me absolutely not if I see a guy that's you're six 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 seven whatever you yeah, if I see a big guy that I know that I can't handle physically mm -hmm. right I don't care what color he is that's a threat right right if we're no. going at it I'm gonna get my ass fucking kicked so I'm gonna figure out a way to not engage with this man whether okay. it's tasing him or using whatever I don't see it, in, you know, but, but to your other point, and here's the thing, like, I think there's a perception um, that more white guys get killed by the cops in this country than black guys. Oh, yes. So statistically, the argument that, you know, that you're more at risk than the white guy, it just doesn't play out statistically. Well, there's more white guys too, Greg, and I'm not saying, you know. I'm more at risk in my neighborhood of where I'm from, though. Most likely. Yeah, right. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all these things have to be taken into consideration. I don't think that, that the vast majority, I don't think that, they, that they're racially motivated shootings. Mm -hmm. I think that what happens is that horrible scenarios arise, cops out of fear or justified force, 
take action. It always looks bad. It mm. always fucking looks bad to shoot somebody. No matter what, it just is always going to look bad. And there's always going to be an opportunity to second guess it and go, could it have been done differently and better? Mm. Sometimes yeah, sometimes no. But, you know, I don't think that this racial animosity that we have in this country today is justified. I personally don't believe it. And I think that the police officers today are better than they have ever been in the history of our country. In the 60s, they were the 60s. The 70s, they got better. The 90s were better than the 80s. 2020 is better than 2010 because we're learning through our mistakes mm -hmm. and you can't get away with shit. We're all, you know, everything's monitored. Everything's, you know, three and four levels of, um, you know, of evaluation. Body cameras, all of these things are done so that we have to be held accountable, but it also allows us to see what's going on. And in our culture right now, you know, we're just having knee-jerk reactions to things that look bad. Yeah, exactly. And before, you know, before we wrap up, because we've been talking a while yeah. now, I wanted to ask you, and this may be a rhetorical question, let's go back to the beginning. Why do you think the murder rate is so high in California? Well, I think that I think cops are afraid to do their job. And so I think that there is to, to James's point is like when the enforcement is less, the streets are going to do more than they would had there not mm. been this presence. And so I think that when we can uh, handcuff the police where they're scared to do their jobs because they're going to get second and triple guessed, you know, we don't have the enforcement capabilities. No consequences. Yeah. I think that maybe that's part of it. And you know what, because this, you know that's true, the state is so liberal, you know, I wanted to go try to buy 12 gauge the other day and, and they were telling me, like, it was just like, you, I might as well have been going to go buy a MAC-10. Because they gave me such a hard time when you don't have this. But before, when I used to go buy 12 gauge, I used to show my ID, get it, and I'm mm -hmm. out of there, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? I, I'm out of there, it took 20, 30 minutes max, you know what I mean? Now you can't go buy bullets. You can't, you know, it's, it's all kind of stuff. So it's almost like this state being so liberal, it almost has empowered the criminal. They got all the guns they want. Well, we'll be we'll be at a loss if we get rid of the police. Oh, yeah, for I sure. Think, I think that the police need to do a little better with how they handle certain situations. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as checking the police that they're putting on the job, Mm -hmm. Because some of them really don't care. Some of them look at it as a paycheck and I'm going home. So they don't care how they treat the people. Anytime you get a police officer that, that will beat the shit out of a 65-year-old woman, he's mad at something else. Don't bring that to your job. Mm -hmm. And I think they need to fix that part. I think it'll be better. But we have to learn how to police our own hoods and, and let's say, help police our own hoods because we ain't gonna be able to do it you know I what mean, I'm saying yeah we we definitely need the police and I think one thing yeah it would be dumb to get rid of the police what, that's what the I don't dumbest shit of all yeah, that's stupid but fun. what what we need is I feel we need to have more um we have we need to have more communication with officers who join in the fucking forces right with as far as why you wanna patrol over here this the bomb and shit right here if you can get us to work with the police, like on some hand in hands for the real shit, and be in there, because the first thing they're gonna say, "Oh, you fucking with the police? He a snitch." No, I mean, no, we, I'm, what is the community? What do the community mean to you? We turn it up, so it don't mean shit to us. You know what I'm saying? So you get them and you work with them to help us get rid of and fix the shit that. The, the, sword, like me. The, the sword thumbs. You know what shit. I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We need because to get rid of the sword thumbs. That'll stop people from getting killed and you have I mean, a better but, understanding. Yeah, but like you them. said. If you can't get rid of a mob, James, you're going to always have a fucking problem. You know what I'm saying? Because that dude purpose is just to be a gangbanger and create havoc. So you got to remove him. You know what I'm saying? If, if you can't do that, the hood ain't going to do it unless he no. get killed. That's the only way to get rid of him. But if you... If, if you Got guys like us and saying, okay, our hood, we need to fix this. So, because it saves your nieces, your little cousins, your nephews, and everybody else, because mm -hmm. now they see us working with them, 
helping fix what we call our community, our neighborhood. Yeah, and you, you see what I'm saying? If you, you know, don't do that, then we, we fight each other. And you know what the problem is, man? The first thing somebody goes say, oh, he's working with the police because people's definition of what snitching is is so like skewed and fucked up nowadays. For the record, snitching is this. If you are a member of the underworld and you partake in any criminal activity, like you go rob a bank, your partner you rob the bank with don't get caught, but you get caught and you say, well, man, I know the eight. He the one to talk me into this shit, and he won. He still got $150,000. He did it, and he hiding over his cousin's house in Riverside. That's snitching right there. That is what snitching is right there. If my wife, I'm not at home now, if somebody's breaking the house and she called the alarm company and they come over there and say, that man was trying to break in my window. She is a civilian woman. She is not a snitch. She's incapable of being a snitch. And that's the most ridiculous shit I ever heard. So what you call a, a confident uh, uh Oh, yeah, that's it. But I'm just saying, these, these kids today, they, got, they call them motherfuckers rats just to call people rats. You got people out there today and just well, don't I, like That's all behind that hip-hop doing. shit. In the code of of hip hop, and the code of you know the the Takashi bullshit and all that shit, and and like I said, the youth today, uh, they inherit uh, uh, the snitching shit as some new form of whatever. Like you said, we've been dealing with that shit for decades. Motherfuckers used to go tell Bumpy Johnson or who was doing this or delivering the numbers or whatever, whatever. So we've had snitching, so to speak, since the beginning of time. What it is is that. Civilians, we never considered civilians to be snitchers. You know, we never considered a motherfucker if it was an innocent kid got killed or a baby, and you told who did the drive-by shooting or shit. You know, it's just a different code that we have, and what the kids want to do nowadays. Uh, so, it shouldn't be a factor of niggas from the neighborhood wanting to control the neighborhood on a positive aspect because shit when you're happy and everything is fun and fine and everybody got money you usually don't have no fucking problems so and then another thing with trying to control our areas and getting rid of the bad motherfuckers you just have to get you a pack of niggas who want to see the hood doing better Mm -hmm. it's a gang of niggas and and I'm going to end it like this Mm -hmm. I just want to ask one question Mm -hmm. one last question before we get out of here um, we need police. Your mentality when you were a kid. What made you want to become a cop? So um, I never thought about it as a kid. Like it was never even a, a thought in my mind. And then as I got older and uh, realized that you know I was going to have to make it on my own and figure out how to how to do that, a friend of mine's dad was a cop, and he was also my football coach. And so he was somewhat of a mentor. And uh, so I grew up without a, my, a dad. And so, uh, you know, I kind of fell under this guy's influence. And he's like, Greg, you know, you're heading in a direction where it's very easy for you to get, you know, into a situation where you'll never have an opportunity to do this because, you, know, you know, I was heading for trouble. And he goes, you know, but so far, you haven't gotten to the point where you've disqualified yourself and it's a good career and so I, I didn't do it out of this you know this aspiration of like I just want to be a cop I looked at it as this is a really good career and it's a chance for me to get in a good profession I was relatively uneducated I had a GED mm-hmm. um, and to your other point though I think education should be absolutely required for anybody going into law enforcement you should have a college education mm-hmm. and these days you know I think that that's mm-hmm. um, but for me, I got it. I got into it because there was an opportunity, and then once I started, um, I just I, I, I it, it was the right career path for me, just because of the fact that you know I grew up all around dope. I grew up with a hippie mom. I grew up in all of this environment, but also saw the sinister aspect of it of the people that were dealing those dope or dealing drugs. So all of that just evolved into me being. Um, a police officer that I think I was relatively f- fit for. I don't know if that answered your question. It, it, just, it just ends with what I was trying to say and end with is you have to appreciate your job or you want to, you know, I don't think you, you, you can come into law enforcement or want to be a police with the mentality of, 
that fuck it, you get me? You know, you thought it was a good career. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, you were able to come in and figure out, yeah, dope shit is fucked up. And crackheads and fucking kids, whatever, whatever. So that's what I'm saying about today. With the policing, we need to find motherfuckers who really are passionate about being a fucking police officer. That's, that's mm -hmm. the point. He was able to relate growing up, seeing this shit. So now I'm a police officer. Now that he's a police officer, he can relate to being on the street and see the shit that was going on. He see what's going on. Mm -hmm. and, and now I can, I relate to talking to these people because I've been around it. Exactly. I know what it's about. So... It's, it, it, it's a good move. So Definitely. you can honestly say he's in the right place because I, I can relate to you people. I can relate to what you're going through. Cocaine hit everybody. Cocaine, right. it, it didn't have no, 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 it wasn't racist. It, it took everybody out. And I, I think that would, was, would be way better for situations today if dudes who joined the force were educated Mm -hmm. uh, we're knowledgeable about where they're from the police, the people in the area, the community, mm -hmm. and not just right now. You get me? You need to study and learn about what's been happening over in the mob for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. You need to know what went down in Tragnu or Southside or wherever. Well, they do. They briefing. So that, that's all. That was my last point. I'm done. There, there's just real quick. The, the, I 100% agree with what you said about we bought, we've got to work together. Right? right, we've got to figure that out. How to, you know, regain uh, a mutual um, respect for one another. Right. But you started this whole thing out with like, what is it like to grow up in hopelessness? And like, until we get those communities to where there's to where there's opportunity, until you can get those communities to where there's opportunity, there's going to be hopelessness. And when the hopelessness becomes a devaluation of life. And with devaluation of life, well, I'm just going to take some shit from you to take your life because it really doesn't mean anything. And that, until we get those communities to where there's opportunity, then you're still going to have that sense of like, what the fuck? Why not? I'll just mm -hmm. go out and take mine. That's right. Is that right? I yes, mean, indeed. I, I just feel like you've got to figure out how to make these you gotta communities figure out, where yeah. people feel like well, people have to opportunities towards. to work towards. You know, when you ain't got an opportunity to work towards nothing, shit, it's going to be a bad day. Yep. Yeah. And with that. That wraps up another episode of the Gangster Chronicles podcast. We'd like to thank Greg Kading, man, for giving us some really insightful information. And Greg, All the time. Yeah. you got a podcast coming out, don't you? I'm hoping to. You know, I'm trying to do this little thing. I want to do, uh, you guys remember that Christopher Dorner case? That LAPD yeah, that's cop yeah. on that yeah. rampage? I'm going to try to do something with that. Oh, that's really yeah. dope, yeah, that's, man. That, that's, that's dope. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, we could be helping, helping Greg out with that, man, and supporting him for whatever he needs, man, because he's definitely a friend of the show. Indeed. And you'll hear more from him. Um, make sure you go check out our website, man, www.thegangstachroniclespodcast.com. Hit us up on Instagram at the Gangster Chronicles Podcast and everywhere else. Um, make sure you download that iHeart app. Go to Apple iTunes, subscribe, comment, and we out of here. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all right, y'all. Uh, all across the USC, Compton, Watts, Bay to LA. From on the California, from valley to valley, we represent that killer Cali. So if you keeping it real on your side of your town, you tune in to Gangsta Chronicles. Yeah. Gangsta Chronicles, we gon' tell you how it goes. Uh, if I lie, my nose will grow like Pinocchio. We gon' tell you the truth and nothing but the truth. Oh. Gangsta Chronicles, this is not your average show. You're now tuned into the real MCA, Big James, and Big Steel. This so. is strictly from the streets. Hello. We represent the G's, never know one of these. Gangsters, hustlers, players on the car. Tune in like every week. If you wanna hear the real, well, you didn't come to the right spot. Gangster Chronicle. Finally get a chance to let the